This is Ham College, Episode 79, for July 31st, 2021. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Heard it, worked it, logged it. Keep your competitive contesting edge with ICOM. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And boy, put your seatbelts on tonight. Could get a little bumpy in here. We don't know. Uh, The live chat, the normal chat room is down tonight. Uh, For some reason, Freenode is not working. So we're using the chat that's built in to YouTube. If you're watching live, I'm going to go ahead and just throw that up anyway, because it'll just tell you what I just said. A tough set of questions for you tonight. I hope everyone has been studying. I, I, I don't have any hopes you have, but but maybe you have. If not... I, I haven't, but I wish I did. Well, I did because I had to so we could explain some of this stuff. Uh, so I guess I'm going to get all the buzzer action tonight. I might get some because there's a few points in there I'm still a little blurry on. Well, it's, it's it's pretty rough. What did we talk about in the last episode? Do you recall? <sighs> Measure, uh, measurements and stuff, I think, in uh, some test gear, best I remember. I it think like it's been a whole month since we did it. It has been a whole month, and I think it was measurement techniques and limitations, instrument accuracy and performance limitations, probes, techniques to minimize errors, measurement of Q, instrument calibration as parameters, and vector network analyzers. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay. So tonight we're going to take it easy on you. What are we going to cover? Receiver performance characteristics, phase noise, noise floor, Image rejection, MDS, signal-to-noise ratio, noise figure, reciprocal mixing, selectivity, effects of SDR, receiver, non-linearity, use of attenuators at low frequencies. And I'm already ready to call in sick today. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, um, I can understand why. This is going to be rough. Yeah, it's going to be a challenge, that's for sure. (laughs) Well, we might as well get on into them. May as well. Go ahead and get the buzzer going. So why don't I I, ask... uh, I forgot to go get some smart water. All I got is regular water. Yeah. So since the first question here, I actually had to do some studying on it. It wouldn't be fair if you asked me, so I'll ask you. What is the effect of excessive phase noise in a receiver's local oscillator? Is it A, it limits the receiver's ability to receive strong signals? B, it can affect the receiver's frequency calibration. C, it decreases receiver third-order intercept point. Or D, it can combine with strong signals on nearby frequencies to generate interference. What's the effect, excessive, what's the uh, effect, I can't even read the question right. What's an effect of excessive phase noise in a receiver's local oscillator? Phase noise. Limits receivers keep a lot of Ability to receive strong signals. I don't. I don't think it would be a. I don't think can affect receivers' frequency calibration. Noise shouldn't do that. I don't think decreases the receiver's third order intercept point. I don't even know what that is. 
So I'm hoping Mr. Wizard will explain that part after. <laughs> you can combine with a strong signal on nearby frequencies to generate interference. I'm a, I'm gonna go with D because I don't think those others are right. I don't know the I don't know the answer. Okay. Well, they're kind of mixed in the chat room. Most of them are saying either B or D. Oh, yeah. I don't think it would mess with the calibration. It, it might, but uh, that doesn't seem right to me. You did pretty good on that one. Well, yeah, only from eliminating the ones that I don't think it is. That seems like the most plausible one. Yeah. Well, let's... Let's just talk it, about is it. Is there a thing as a third order intercept point? I've never heard of it. There is. <clears throat> is it? Yep. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't know it before because I might have picked that one then. Well, there's also such a thing as strong signals and frequency calibration, too. Phase noise is noise that's generated by the local oscillator in a receiver, but it can also be present in transmitted signals. The oscillator... In, in the process of correcting itself, can generate that. It wasn't as big an issue back when, say, we didn't have phase lock loop circuits, although I guess it could still have been an issue. Then the issue was that your frequency could drift, you know, and, and move around. By using phase lock loop circuits, it could lock precisely on a frequency, but what it's actually doing is adjusting the oscillator uh, and actually adjusting the phase when it does that. And that can create some sidebands on the signal that, uh, hmm. that can cause some interference. Also, not just phase lock loops can, can cause that to happen. DDS circuits as well, direct digital synthesis, which is a real popular method of making oscillators these days, they can suffer from the, the same issue. It's because of the way the signal is constructed. It can have a little phase noise in there, too. And why does it, does it cause interference in the receiver? Well, if we look at this right here, right there in the center... In red, you see I've got a peak there marked as strong adjacent signal. Let's say that's something you don't want to hear. You can see where the receive filter pass band is. That's the bandwidth that you've got your receiver set for. You may have adjustable bandwidth on your receiver, and you're adjusting that to kind of narrow it up. And you can see the way we've got it set. We shouldn't hear that strong adjacent signal because it's outside of the passband. We've got the passband narrow enough that we don't hear that strong signal. But if you look at the uh, very lowest part of the signal there, the black line is the receiver noise floor. In other words, that's the quietest that receiver can be. The receiver's got some noise itself. That would be considered the noise floor. And if you see those little skirts kind of leading up to that strong adjacent signal oscillator phase noise, that's the sidebands that are created by the PLL circuit or the DDS circuit. They stretch out further than the signal itself. And you see that little weak signal I've got, mm -hmm. uh, got written in blue there. So that's a weak signal down there. And if we didn't have that phase noise, we could probably hear that signal because it's above the noise floor of the receiver. However, the phase noise is just enough that it's covering up that signal. Not entirely, but enough we probably can't hear that. That's why you want low phase noise. There is a big variance in phase noise specs on receivers. It's something you might want to check out if you're thinking about getting a new transceiver. Clear as mud? Yep. Clear as mud. Mississippi mud. Which of the following receiver circuits can be effective in eliminating interference from strong out-of-band signals? A, a front-end filter or pre-selector. B, a narrow IF filter. C, a notch filter. Or D, a properly adjusted product detector. Hmm. Hmm. 
Which of the following receiver circuits can be effective in eliminating interference from strong out-of-band signals? A notch filter, that's just going to put a notch on in one particular spot. It's not really going to cover out-of-band so much. Um, properly adjusted product detector. Uh, I don't think so. A narrow IF filter. Mm, yeah, narrow IF, I mean, that's probably going to have more effect on stuff that's actually in-band or signals that are sort of nearby you. So I'm going to say it's A, a front-end filter, or pre-selector. What do you think, Dean? Uh, yeah, I'll buy that. Let's see. I, I was thinking that one was probably uh, plausible, or then I was thinking of either C or A. Yeah. But since you said A, yeah, I'm going to go A, too. There were some mixed, mixed answers in there in the chat room. So let's just see. And it is. A front-end filter or pre-selector. What is the term for the suppression in an FM receiver of one signal by another stronger signal on the same frequency? A, desensitization. Close enough. B, cross-modulation interference. C, capture effect. Or D, frequency discrimination. What term for suppression in an FM receiver of one signal by another stronger signal on the same frequency? I don't think it's decent because that's, that's when something's close by, not exactly on the same frequency. At least that's, what, that's my understanding of it. Cross-modulation interference. I'm going to go with D. I, I don't really know. I don't. Uh, I could see, see, in my mind I can picture that, but I don't know that that's the answer either. Cross-modulation. I don't think it's B, and I'm, I don't think it's A either, because I think A is just a different definition. So you say in D, Delta? I'll go with D. Okay. Well, let's see. There, there was some mixed answers in the chat room. There were some changed answers, too. Uh, some people initially said one answer and then uh, changed it. So, tough question. That, that was tough. <clears throat> I'm, I'm familiar with this one. Just I'm before I was a ham because of FM radio and. You, you're listening to a station and maybe move your antenna a little bit and all of a sudden it just pops on a different station. Mm -hmm. And then move it again and it's back to the first station. It's one or the other is capturing the receiver. Sometimes you can't actually hear two FM signals at the same time. Kind of rare, but uh, generally one is just going to swamp it, it would out. That, would that be B, cross-modulation? I'm not sure what cross modulation would be. Yeah. But um the capture effect is the effect that that they're looking for there. Well, I captured the buzzer. Well, there you go. That ought to be worth something. Okay, next question. What is the noise figure of a receiver? A, the ratio of atmospheric noise to phase noise. Hmm. B, the ratio of the noise bandwidth in hertz to the theoretical bandwidth of a resistive network. C, the ratio of thermal noise to atmospheric noise. Or D, the ratio in dB of the noise generated by the receiver to the theoretical minimum noise. What is the noise figure of the receiver? The ratio of atmospheric noise to phase noise, that's not it. 
Noise figure. Uh, be the I'm ratio, glad you got this one. Be the ratio of noise, bandwidth, and hertz to the theoretical bandwidth of a resistive network. No, I don't think so. See, the ratio of thermal noise to atmospheric noise. No, atmospheric noise has nothing to do with the noise figure of the receiver. So I think we can discredit that one as well. So D, the ratio in dB of the noise generated by the receiver to the theoretical minimum noise. That kind of makes sense. That's what it sounds like to me. And that's what everybody's saying in the chat room, so I feel pretty good about that answer. Yeah, I would have picked that one myself. Okay. There we go. I'm glad I got an easy one there. Next I one. Think this, I think this deck was stacked, man. No. I don't <laughs> think so. They're all kind of tough. Yeah. What does a receiver noise floor of minus 174 dBm represent? A, the minimum detectable signal as a function of received frequency. B, theoretical noise and a 1 hertz bandwidth at the input of a perfect receiver at room temperature. C, the noise figure of a 1 hertz bandwidth receiver. Or D, the galactic noise contribution to minimum detectable signal. Galactic noise contribution. <clears throat> Sounds important. Well, yeah. Receiver noise floor of minus 174 dBm. The minimum detectable signal as a function of the receiver frequency. I don't think that's it because that's a specific number. I think there would have to be a baseline for that. Theoretical noise and a one hertz bandwidth at the input of a perfect receiver at room temperature. The noise figure of a one hertz bandwidth receiver. That doesn't really give you a base a baseline either. D, the galactic noise contribution to minimum detectable signal. I don't think that's it either. Minus, I don't really know the answer. I'm just going to have to reason out the ones that are not the answer, and hopefully I can get it. But I don't think it's A, and I don't think it's D. So we're down to B or C. The noise figure of a 1 hertz bandwidth receiver. The noise figure. Or the, or the theoretical noise in a 1 hertz bandwidth. At the input of a perfect receiver. They specified a perfect receiver at room temperature. I'm going to go with B. Okay. I, I don't know if that's right, but that's, I guess, they're, they're that's little... my concocted logic. They're a little mixed in the chat room, uh, A or B. And Arnie says uh, A, B, C, or D. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. I'm going to agree with you. I think it's B, although that answer does seem mighty long and nitpicky. That's the answer. Yeah, well, it boils it down pretty specific. And the other ones are fairly vague. And that's a, that's a specific measurement. Well, I'll, I'll be honest here. When I was first looking at these questions, entering them in, I don't remember what I chose for this one, but I had no idea what the real answer was. I remember that. Well, I didn't have any idea either when I saw it, So, but I, I just reasoned it out. Or yeah. I did the process of elimination, and hopefully I landed on the right one. A CW receiver with the AGC off has an equivalent input noise power density, there's that no number again, of minus 174 dBm hertz. 
uh, what would be the level of an unmodulated carrier input to this receiver that would yield an audio output SNR signal to noise ratio of 0 dB in a 400 hertz noise bandwidth? A, minus 174 dBm. B, minus 164 dBm. C, minus 155 dBm. Or D, minus 148 dBm. Sorry, I was still kind of dumbfounded by the question. I had never made it to the options to uh, pick an answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is one of those that, you know, you, you have the option of bringing a calculator with you to the exam. Yeah. Or, or I think <clears throat> they would accept a slide rule, too. I'm going to bring a calculator. How is that? Does that okay. work for you? All right. Well, let's let's try it then. You want to do some gazintas? Uh, and some gazatas as well. I think I'm going to need a scientific calculator. What else would a professor use? True. But minus 174 dBm hertz. And a 400 hertz noise bandwidth. It just so happens that the formula to figure this out is your dBm that you're starting with plus 10 log of the bandwidth. 400, 10 log of that. That's the log of it times 10. Our dBm figure was minus 174. I'm going to say it's minus 148 dBm D. Okay. Um, they're not really guessing on this one in the chat room so much, Tommy. Hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder why. I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> okay. I think I'm going to sit down a while now. Yeah, I think I'm... I'm gonna have to go lay down after this ham college is over, man. <laughs> well, let's let's do one more question first before we take a break. Okay. How about a good easy one? Okay. What does the MDS of a receiver represent? Is it A the meter display sensitivity? B the minimum discernible signal. C the multiplex distortion stability. Or D, the maximum detectable spectrum. I'm going to go with B, the minimum discernible signal, just because the others are wrong. Well, okay. I don't think is the meter display sensitivity. I mean, that could be. I, I think it's going to be B, minimum signal that you could actually hear. Yeah, that, that would probably be a good thing to know. Multiple distortion stability. No. I think it's going to be B. I'm sticking with that. <clears throat> okay. They're saying B over in the chat room. You you could be on something there. Could be on to a minimum discernible signal. Yep. It looks like you are. You did, at least you gave me an easy one for that before we went into the break. Yeah, I, I noticed how easy it was because you just went straight for the throat there, man. You yeah, just... that one was easy. I've, I've heard of that before. Yeah. Okay. Well, so far only one buzzer tonight. There's more to go. ICOM has the base station of your dreams with the IC7851, IC7610, IC9700, and IC7300 STR transceivers. ICOM's amateur radios are top of the line and are the first choice for contesters across the globe. Robust base stations like these cut through pileups letting you work the bands and record those contacts. Keep your competitive edge with ICOM. Heard it, worked it, logged it. The IC7851 gives you a new window into the RF world and is HF excellence unparalleled. With faster processors, high input gain, high display resolution, and a cleaner signal, it's truly the pinnacle of HF perfection. Dual receivers, digital IF filters, memory keyer, 
digital voice recorder, high-resolution spectrum waterfall display, enhanced PC connectivity, and SD memory card slot. The ICOM IC7610 is the SDR Everyham wants. This high-performance SDR can pick out the faintest of signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. RF Direct Sampling System, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. This all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy, faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. 4.3-inch color touchscreen display, real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. The ICOM IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. This high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design will far exceed your expectations. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Tommy, what do you say we give away something? Hey, I got some stuff here. Well, that's fine. I want to give away a pretty cool ICOM ball cap and a nice ICOM ham crew t-shirt, similar to the one I have right here. <clears throat> but this time I won't give away my used one. We'll, we'll get uh, Jesse at ICOM to send you a brand new one. Okay. Uh, ham crew look, look just as good when you leave the ham fest as you did when you arrived. All right. That is a mighty nice looking shirt there. It is. It's a nice ball cap, too. Oh, yeah. Send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. You don't need a license. You don't need anything but a name and an email address. If you want to put uh, a note in there, that's fine, but that's not required either. And uh, when you do that, you'll get in entered. For the drawing for this month, after this drawing, the queue gets cleared out. So if you didn't win and you want to try again next month, you'll need to send your name and back in again for the next drawing. Okay. So who's the lucky winner? Well, tonight's lucky winner is John Hyatt, KC7DRI. Oh, John. he's in the chat room. Congrats, John. Yeah. He said, just tossing my name in the hat for a chance at the ICOM swag. You guys always put on a fun show. Congrats, John. Uh, Jesse will be getting in touch with you soon to, uh, to get your stuff out to you. Yep. Where did we let leave get, off? Let me put my thinking cap on. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think I asked you the last question. You did? An SDR receiver is overloaded when input signals exceed what level? A, one-half the maximum sample rate. B, one-half the maximum sampling buffer size. C, the maximum count value of the analog-to-digital converter. Or D, the reference voltage of the analog-to-digital converter. Oh. An SDR receiver is overloaded when input signals exceed what level? One half the maximum sample rate. Now, I mean, you know, your sampling rate's generally going to be twice the highest frequency that you're interested in, but it's not going to overload if if there's um, you know a signal that exceeds that. There's Generally, filters in front of that, too. B, one-half the maximum sampling buffer size. I don't think that's it. C, the maximum count value of the analog-to-digital converter. I'm not sure 
if that term is valid or not. I know there's a maximum count when you're talking about voltmeters or uh, digital voltmeters. D, the reference voltage of the analog to digital converter. And you know, if you put too hot a signal into, um, say, a digital recorder, or I guess any you know analog to digital device, if you exceed it, you're going to overload it, probably clip or make all kinds of racket when that happens, uh, just depending on the circuit, but you're going to be overloading it. And the reference voltage is just happens to be the maximum voltage on an A to D converter. So I that's it. That's gotta be a D the reference voltage. Chat okay. room. Mm, some of them are saying C or A. Yeah, C and A. Yeah. <clears throat> you know that this is one of those kind of questions I know was not on the exam when I took it. He okay. nailed it. Well, I got through it. Well, you got through it. That is a tough one. There's Sometimes there. that's good enough. There's several answers there that sound like they could be it, and that maximum count sure sounds like like that's a possible answer. They are sneaky. <clears throat> Oops. Were you looking? Yes. I'll oh. get to, I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard not to see it. Yeah, I know. Well we gotta do it anyway. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to give it away. <laughs> you <laughs> you can cut that out of the edited one of those people think I'm real smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> What to the this following? Is, I put smart water in here instead of this regular cheap water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which of the following choices is a good reason for selecting a high frequency for the design of a IF in a super heterodyne HF or VHF communications receiver? Is it A, fewer components in the receiver? B, reduced drift? C, Easier for front-end circuitry to eliminate image responses. Or improved receiver noise figures. Which of the following... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this here. Which of the following choices is a good reason for selecting a high frequency for the design of the IF for a super HF or VHF receiver? Fewer components. I wouldn't pick that. Reduced drift. I wouldn't. I don't think I would pick that either. Easier for front end circuitry to eliminate image responses. Improve receiver noise figure. So let me ask you. If I hadn't just accidentally flashed the answer in front of you, which one of those do you think you would have chosen? Yeah, so I was just trying to figure that out. If I if I figured out myself, uh, I wouldn't pick A or B. I'm sure uh, I would have picked either C or D. Improve receiver noise figure. And I don't think the IF having a higher frequency would affect the noise figure. I would have probably picked C, I think. I don't think the higher frequency would affect the noise for the figure for the receiver. Yeah. Well, everyone in the chat room is saying C. They are. It's a smart group in there. You can't trick them. Yeah, they're paying attention. <clears throat> and it is C. Nobody even blinked when that was up there, too. Yeah, it was they, only up there for like a fraction of a second. Yeah, that's all it took. All right. I, look, I'm not even going to flash the answer up on this one. Okay. Well, you don't have to flash it on this one, but the next one would be appreciated. <laughs> okay. 
What is an advantage of having a variety of receiver IF bandwidths for which to select? A, the noise figure of the RF amplifier can be adjusted to match the modulation type, thus increasing receiver sensitivity. B, receiver power consumption can be reduced when wider bandwidth is not required. C, receive bandwidth can be set to match the modulation bandwidth, maximizing signal to noise ratio and minimizing interference. Or D, multiple frequencies can be received simultaneously if desired. Hmm. What is the advantage of having a variety of receive IF bandwidths from which to select? The noise figure of the RF amplifier can be adjusted to match the modulation type, thus increasing receiver sensitivity. Nah. B. Receiver power consumption can be reduced when wider bandwidth is not required. I don't think it could. And, and you know, I'm thinking receiver bandwidth is so, power consumption is so low anyway. Why would you care? Well, I guess you would if you were on a battery rig. But I don't think that's it. You might think. D, multiple frequencies can be received simultaneously if desired. And, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why you would desire that. Um, but, you know, increasing the, the bandwidth, yeah, you might. I'm thinking you might hear more than traffic on a single frequency, so that's kind of throwing me off, but C, receive bandwidth can be set to match the modulation bandwidth, maximizing signal-to-noise ratio and minimizing interference. You know, that's the best choice there because that's what it does. You know, it, you only have the bandwidth wide enough just to hear the signal that you want and you can cut out all that garbage on either side of it. So I'm going uh -huh. with C. All right, let's see if I got another one here. Why can an attenuator be used to reduce receiver overload on the lower frequency HF bands with little or no impact on signal to noise ratios? A, the attenuator has a low pass filter to increase the strength of the lower frequency signals. B, the attenuator has a noise filter to suppress interference. C. Signals are attenuated separately from the noise. Or D. Atmospheric noise is generally greater than internally generated noise, even after attenuation. Why can an attenuator be used to reduce the receiver overload on a low frequency HF band with little or no impact to the signal to noise ratio? Low pass filter to increase the strength. Now uh, it's not a. B. The attenuator has a noise filter to suppress interference. The attenuator is a, just an attenuator, so not B either. Signals are attenuated separately from the noise. Well, I think his attenuator is going to attenuate everything. Atmospheric noise is generally greater than the internally generated noise, even after attenuation. Well, that makes sense. The atmospheric noise is going to be greater than the self-noise in the receiver, which I think that's what it's talking about. I'm going to go with D, because I don't think it's A, B, or C. Okay. I'll um, agree with you. And that makes sense to me. And just about everyone in the chat room agrees with you, too. And it is. Hmm. Good cipher in there. So far, yeah. So far, there's only one buzz, buzzer. Yep. Probably going to fix that. Hmm. We've got a few questions to go. Yeah. 
So, so are you saying there's a chance? There's a chance. <clears throat> Which of the following has the largest effect on an SDR receiver's dynamic range? A, CPU register width in bits. B, anti-aliasing input filter bandwidth. C, RAM speed used for data storage. Or D, analog to digital converter sample width in bits. Oh. Hmm. Which of the following has the largest effect on an SDR receiver's dynamic range? I actually know this one. Yeah. A, CPU register width in bits. No. B. Anti aliasing input filter bandwidth. No. Uh, RAM speed used for data storage. No. D. Analog to digital converter sample width in bits. That's what I'm going with is D. And. Chat room's going I would with D. Yep. More bits, higher resolution and signal processing is what uh, what Bob West says, and that is uh -huh. correct. You know, the the actual signal is is stored in a digital number there, or in so many bits. The more bits, the bigger, or it's zero is the lowest you can store anyway, but the larger number, so you got more range between the minimum and the maximum. Better uh -huh. resolution, better dynamic yep. range. Similar to my little microphone here. I got a little 32-bit record microphone. It's incredible, mm -hmm. the dynamic range on it. it the same exact same principle. Yep. How does a narrow-band roofing filter affect receiver performance? A, it improves sensitivity by reducing front-end noise. B, it improves intelligibility by using low-Q circuitry to reduce ringing. C, it improves dynamic range by attenuating strong signals near the receive frequency. Or D, all these choices are correct. A narrow-band roofing filter affects the receiver performance. Improves sensitivity by reducing the front end noise. I think that's probably possible. Improves intelligibility by using low Q circuitry. Improves dynamic range by attenuating strong signals near the receive frequency. I think it's D. All of them. Okay. But the chat room's not agreeing with me, so I'm probably wrong. No, they're not all giving an answer either, but those who are are, are saying C. Improves sensitivity. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with them. C? Yeah, I think so. Well, I was <laughs> just about to change mine, too. Too late. What transmit frequency might generate an image response signal in a receiver tuned to 14.300 megahertz that uses a 455 kilohertz IF frequency. A, 13.845 megahertz. B, 14.755 megahertz. C, 14.445 megahertz. Or D, 15.21 megahertz. I believe what I need to do here is take the IF frequency and multiply it by 2 and then add 14,300 to it. 455 times 2, 910, plus 14,300. I'm going to say it's D, 15.2. 210 megahertz. Let's see. Okay. Lucky what was the formula one. for that? Formula? It's the frequency 
plus uh, the IF times the IF, or two times the IF plus the frequency. Oh, okay. What is reciprocal mixing? <clears throat> A, two out-of-band signals mixing to generate an in-band spurious signal. Oh, boy. B, in-phase signals canceling in the mixer resulting in a loss of receiver sensitivity. B, two digital signals combining from alternate time slots. D, local oscillator phase noise mixing with adjacent strong signals to create interference to the desired signals. Reciprocal mixing. I don't think it's A. Are in-phase signals canceling in a mixer? Two are in-phase and they're canceling? I don't think it's B either. Out-of-phase would cancel each other, right? Yeah. C, two digital signals combining from alternate time slots. Local oscillator phase noise mixing with adjacent strong signals create interference to the desired signals. I think it's D. I think it's D because I don't think it's A, B, or C. And, it's, and it sounds like that could be the definition for reciprocal mixing. So I'm going with D. Well, and that's what everyone in the chat room is saying. And it they is. They cheated off my paper. Yep. And if you, they put theirs down before I did. If you remember that diagram we had earlier? Uh huh. This, in fact, is reciprocal mixing, where the sidebands off that adjacent signal are mixing with the signal you're trying to pick up. Some super tough questions tonight. Is that the last one? That was the last one. I'll drink to that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think I'll, I don't have the smart water. I've just got the purified water, but that's good enough. Yeah, that's all I got, too. I got two buzzers tonight. It's pretty clear this is not smart water. <laughs> All right. We're going to take another quick break, and we'll be right back. Hey, you going to do this thing, the Possible Operations Challenge? I'm not sure. Don't the big stations always win these things? No, not this one. They level this all up by how they score the contacts. Well, I bet the big boys are sweating a bit now. The little stations have a chance if they're a good operator. But I'm in. Can we do it anywhere outdoors? Yeah, that's why it's the Portable Operations Challenge. Let's just go and show them what the small station can do. It'll really set the cat amongst the pigeons. Radio sport and a level playing field, I call that. Radio sport is about competition, and you've been challenged. See foxmicotail.com stroke challenge for details. Are you going to take the challenge? I don't know. I was just looking at that. September 4th and 5th, I think it said. I believe. Yeah. I don't know. It just depends if I can get away and do that. It, you know, things, I got a little different situation going these days. So getting away sometimes is a little bit of a challenge itself. So I have yeah. to look at it and see. It sounds like fun, though. Yeah. It does. It's a, a different kind of, uh, I don't know if they call it a contest. He's calling it a challenge. But yeah, it's yeah. A, a different type of event. Yeah, and uh, low power low power is uh, is okay. So it sounds like a good time to take my seven oh five out and play with it. Oh yeah, you you know you get brownie points for that. Yeah, brownie points are always good. Uh, Nigel says he got one hundred percent tonight. Awesome. Spike had one wrong. Marty's head hurts. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a tough night, man. Uh, this is this is I can I can say without a doubt this is the toughest night of questions that we've had since we've been doing ham college. Out of the other seventy eight or however many there were, I know this shirt has got to be hurting some people's eyes because. <laughs> It is, it is so bright, and it, I was even accused of being blurry tonight. Although, yeah, I am 
you know, a bit out of focus, I think. At least I feel that way. I thought it was because you were moving so fast. Uh, th no, I don't think that's the case. I don't <laughs> have that problem much anymore. <laughs> so if I did want to change wardrobe... Well, if you want to get one that wasn't quite so bright, or you could get one that's even brighter than that, you could go to shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash amateur logic. We've got uh, shirts, caps, cups, uh, backpacks. There are all kinds of things on there. Shop.spreadshirt.com slash amateur logic. The Amateur Logic Soundcheck Net, 8 p.m. Central or 0100 UTC. We're on almost all the digital modes. A lot of these are linked up to some of your local repeaters. Streams live on uh, YouTube at the same place you're watching this live stream, if you happen to be in there right now. There's usually a question on the net. Join us Tuesday night at 8 Central 0100 UTC. And... During the month, if you want to find out what's going on, and I guess, you know, you could probably find out whether or not we, um, how we decide on on going to the ham fest coming up here shortly. Well, we'll probably be talking about that right here, facebook.com slash group slash ham college. Yep, or you can follow us at ham college on Twitter. We're also on MeWe, uh, MeWe.com slash join slash ham college. Okay, and groups.io slash g slash amateur logic. Yeah. All Another right. thing is, if you if you didn't uh, win the shirt and the cap tonight, don't forget to send your entry in. Ham College at amateurlogic.tv. So get yourself in the drawing. Yep. And one other thing we always mention is the amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. You can get the show notes for any episode of Amateur Logic or Ham College there. And the reason I want to mention this is I had a question just earlier today. Somebody wanted to know something about surface mount soldering. They were asking, he said, I, I know you did a segment on this one time, and I've got some surface mount soldering I've got to do. So where can I find that? AmateurLogic.tv slash wiki. Yep. All right. That's where we would go look for it. Well, Dean, I think we got through it tonight, not unscathed. A little, uh, little uh, stove I've up. I've been kind of winged a little bit, but it'll heal <laughs> before next month. Yeah. And uh, we'll be ready to go again. All right. Well, we appreciate y'all being with us. Join us again around the 15th of the month for the next Amateur Logic and at the end of the month for Ham College. And don't forget to check out the Amateur Logic shorts that we have. They're posted every Friday that we don't have an episode of Amateur Logic or Ham College. And we've had a lot of, a lot of fun little short videos in there. So check those out as well, and subscribe. Yeah, they're to only us. on. Actually, they're only on YouTube. Yeah, uh, they're not in the Roku feeds. They're not in the uh, Amazon Fire Stick feeds. Uh, you, obviously, you can get them from the YouTube app on those devices. But if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you can set up to get the notification, and you'll see when we post those. Uh, so that's the best way to find out about them. So go subscribe to it if you if you want to join. Okay. All right, and. The chat tonight was done with the chat that's built into YouTube. Uh, it looks like we didn't really have any issues there, so it uh, went okay tonight. So we'll, we'll probably try that again, and it may be subscriber chat. You may have to be a subscriber to be able to participate in the chat in the future. We're, we're not positive. We're still researching it because this was kind of a last-minute thing tonight, right before the show we discovered we're going to have to do that tonight because the other chat was down. Right. So, anyway, thanks for being here, and we will see you all again next month, 7-3. Yep, 7-3, everybody.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. Hey, is this thing on? Your microphone? Yeah. yeah. Did you hear it? Did you hear it tapping? Do it one more time. Yeah, it's on. 